The following program is recommended by the National Education Association. Most people see me as some kind of a character uh, uh, because I'm uh, relatively uninhibited. I'm the kind of fellow that talks in elevators and a bus stop. Uh, I'll be 78 next Saturday. I run across the Golden Gate Bridge to Sausalito every day. That's 17 mile round trip. I do that every day and then after the run, I take a swim in the bay for a half hour. And I bicycle back home to six mile bike ride. That's my routine daily. So I put in 55,000 miles of running in my lifetime. That's in 20 years and I keep a close record of it. So that's a lot of running and uh, crazy has really got something to do with it. Maybe they're all crazy in Northern California or maybe something else is going on here. A certain kind of freedom. You can experiment, follow your dreams, strike it rich, fall in your face, and everyone around you is doing the same thing in their own individual way. Where else would a race give an award for best costume? It brings together 100,000 people of every shape, color, size, and age to celebrate life in a wild surge to the ocean. to say how long I'm going to be running. I might be running a few weeks, uh, I might be running another 20 years. I enjoy life. The only problem is that I got a thing with this fellow that's been chasing me with this overgrown sickle, this fellow they call a Grim Reaper. He's giving me, giving me a run for my money, but I try to outlast him, try to keep him off as long as I can. Stack's anything's possible spirit descends from the gold rush of 1849, when adventurers from around the world combined hard work with expectations of good luck and a good life. The gold rush created a society of strangers. It didn't matter where you'd come from or what you'd done, just what you're doing now and what you were going to do next. It's no different today. It's not a lack of tradition. It's an incredible amount of personal freedom and tolerance. It's okay to be different in Northern California. Just be yourself, as you'll see on Portrait of America. First, they trickled in the gentle California Indians and the Spanish soldiers and missionaries, a few Russian fur traders, and then some American settlers. The trickle became a torrent in 1849 when gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. One reporter wrote, the field is left half planted, the house half built, 
and everything neglected but for the manufacture of shovels and pickaxes. People of every race, background, and belief came by sea or by land, enduring incredible hardships. They crossed the great plains and the deserts only to face formidable mountains, the Sierra Nevadas. Many died along the way, but they kept coming, obsessed with the vision of gold. And gold there was in astounding amounts. You just needed a pick, a strong back, and a good eye. Northern Californians today can still make fortunes, but fortunes aren't always what they're seeking. Even if they're panning for gold, they may be looking for something else. Stick yourself back 75 miles in the, in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a river that could just as easily flip you over and drown you as cool you on a warm summer afternoon. Move more dirt than you'd care to even think about when you go to bed at night. All for the sake of uh, a few little sparkling pieces of metal. But the freedom it gives the individual, the sense of satisfaction, opportunity to sort of touch upon your own sense of youth. In a day when we're dealing with things that are outside of our control, as individuals to deal with. There is a place where a man can find a time and an opportunity to challenge himself on a one-to-one -one basis with nature. I guess maybe it's uh, a California atmosphere, a lot of light and space. Of course, that's one of the reasons I came to California was it was so sports oriented. Certainly before business, I wasn't even thinking about business when I first came to California. Doug Tompkins was looking for adventure, not gold, in Northern California, and found both. A world-class skier, kayaker, and mountain climber, he's also the unassuming head of an amazing success story in the world of fashion, Esprit. It's never the money, it's just the getting up in the morning and the challenge of seeing if you can make it a little better, make it a little bigger. It's exactly like sports. You want to try to improve your skills. When I start riding around the limousines and the Learjets, uh, that'll be the end of my business. <laughs> Susie, yeah. Doug and his wife Susie started with $7,500. With his love of sports and her love of fashion, they captured the essence of California living. They cut it, sewed it, put it on racks, and turned it into a $750 million a year business. Their idea of fashion for everyone means using their employees, their own daughters, and themselves as models. Well, we're a lifestyle marketing company, really. A lot of those living trends or lifestyle trends seem to originate in Northern California or California in general. It sort of rubs off on you. And out of that, the products are born as a natural result of just being in this place. We don't take fashion that seriously because when fashion's too serious, it gets too serious. And so by making fun with your work, the product ends up being fun and has a very whimsical kind of quality to it. Okay, nice. Let me see. That's it, Go closing. Yeah. I think one reason Esprit is so successful is because we're designing a product for ourselves and we're designing an image that we relate to, that we're proud of. I don't know about that one. I know, it looks like I'm breaking your back. You look like some straight businessman. No. I mean, you can be much more individual in California without being a quack. You don't have to get schizophrenic when you're here. It's like if you're working in New York, you have to go to work and be very serious every day, and then on the weekend you're yourself and you're casual and you're silly and you're having fun, and then you go and get really serious and you go to work on the weekdays. It's like you kind of lose track of yourself. But I think in California, you can really be yourself all the time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, I told you. If you're not having fun doing this, you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> You just enjoy it. You know, it's your life. You have to think it and breathe it and do it, and you've got to be it all the time. And if you see people doing this and they're not having fun, I'm sure they're not very good at what they're doing. I am a fun-loving person, so I make it a lot of fun. Since the gold rush, Northern Californians have enjoyed an unusual freedom. Far from the conservative eyes of family, church, and business back home, 
They have the freedom to experiment and fail. This has led to some astonishing successes. I have to be many different people. Um, and I have to be a businessman sometimes, and I'm pretty good at that, although I took some practice. And sometimes I'm a computer scientist, and I talk to professors about um, obscure things. And sometimes I'm an artist, and um, I talk to, to people in design and music and stuff about how computers are uh, fit into their worlds. And um, uh, so I'm all of those people, those are all real. <laughs> A few years ago, Jaron Lanier invented a unique video game. He didn't blast asteroids, he created music. I like just um, blissing out with this stuff. I'm a little kid playing with it, that's who I am. Most of the people in the computer biz won't admit it, but they're actually motivated by excitement too and not by money. When you really get right down to it, um, what I find again and again is the money is, is there. People do like money here a lot, it's true, but um, when you start to talk to somebody about an idea that really is exciting and you, their eyes sparkle. And I found that to be true with big companies and small companies. That's what's really special about the Silicon Valley. 60 miles south of San Francisco, the high-risk, high-gain world of Silicon Valley is a volatile mixture of fast-track venture capitalists racing against each other and the Japanese, of overnight fortunes and corporate spies, of precious metals and toxic chemicals. And behind it all, the visionaries who keep it hurtling into the future. People like 25-year-old Jaron Lanier. I don't have a degree. I don't even have a high school diploma. I have never been able to cope with tests, any structured learning schools and things like that. And um, if I was living in a very rigid society, um, I truly don't know what would happen. I guess I'd become a monk or something. <laughs> Jaron is on the verge of completing a revolutionary computer language based on music and images instead of words, one that anyone could use. It's a huge gamble. He might fail, or society might not be ready. But if he succeeds, his investors will be very rich, and he will profoundly alter the world of computers, which is becoming everyone's world more and more every day. These instruments speak to the human body and to the human heart, and computers will eventually, they have to. Right now, the worlds generated by computers live mostly on television screens. I think in the future, it'll be really quite different, that computers will be just generating a portion of our reality um, that, you know, that there'll be a certain portion of our environment that's physical, and there'll be another part that isn't, and it won't be obvious after a while which is which. And what'll be extraordinary then is that people will be uh, generating their, their world by their imagination as well as the manipulation of physical matter, which is what they do now. And um, then what I think will happen is that people will communicate by immersing other people in their world. I mean, it'll just be, it'll be this amazing thing, which we can't even begin to imagine yet. It'll be a very interesting world because instead of physical matter and wealth and machines being the things that create the world, it'll be imagination. So imagination will be the most prized thing, much more important than gold. Most Californians live in cities hugging the coast. Venture north and you'll find a world of far fewer people. Some left the cities for the independence and peace of mind that nature can provide. Others who were born here have had that sense all their lives. People like Jerry Drury, roaming the hills of Mendocino midway between San Francisco and Oregon. It used to be when three cars a week went by on the county road, you had a heavy traffic problem. Now you get that many in 30 minutes to go by. And the deer, heck, 20, even 15 years ago, it wasn't any problem in a day's ride to see 100, 150 deer. Today, I'll see 10 or a dozen or maybe not that many even in a day. When I was growing up in here, there was only three ranches, really. 
the Blue Rock and Bell Springs and the old Erie Ranch, the old home ranch. And that was all that was in here. There wasn't anybody else. But little by little, they've been broken up and sold. And they don't like to see it. They don't like the thoughts. But these little family ranches, such as we're trying to do here, is a pretty much a thing of the past, really. And the bigger operators can operate on nickels and dimes, and it takes us a dollar to operate on is what it amounts to. Yeah. not a money-making thing. There's lots of things you can do, including driving a truck to make more money than you can ranching. But I enjoy it. Watching the cattle, watching the game, the deer. I enjoyed looking at tracks and see what animals pass there during the night and this sort of thing. I just enjoy the way of life. I don't have to punch a clock. I get up in the morning when I feel like it. I go to bed when I feel like it. I enjoy, I enjoy it. that gives a gracious nod to the old world has evolved around the yearly cycle of winemaking in Napa and Sonoma. Most of America's wines come from large and small wineries throughout California. Perhaps none are quite as small as Duck Soup Wine Works, where Andy and Deborah Cutter value quality and independence over profits. There is a saying in winemaking, if you want to make a small fortune in the wine business, start with a large one. We started with a, a very small amount of money, and now we have less. <laughs> it, it's a tremendously expensive business. But there's a lot of interesting, crazy people that work in the business for some reason. And all of us have a different reason. I've often compared winemaking to being as romantic as running a dairy farm, only it smells better. Definitely. Yeah. Here's... Just really nothing like uh, having no employees and not working for someone else. It's, it's really the best of, of all worlds, and uh, that's what we have here. So if something goes wrong, we've got no one else to blame but ourselves. Well, I can blame you. <laughs> that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> if we made more wine, we would have to hire people. And if we hired people, then we'd have less time to work with the wine ourselves. And that's the part of the wine business that we like the best. It's just the independence to be able to do what you've been thinking about doing when you were working for other people. Mm -hmm. I think our approach to winemaking is a little different than, than most people. I mean, we have fun with it. It's not that we don't take what we do seriously, but we, we have a lot of fun with it, too. So. If you want something serious, open heart surgery, that's serious. Now, wine, that's what the open heart surgeon takes to get over his job. <laughs> so it shouldn't be as serious. And so you can have a lot of fun with wine. The making of it's serious business, but the drinking of it should be a lot of fun. Will somebody split a noodle and, and smoke cam with me with the pea pod? Would you split one of them? Okay, okay, I would like to split the noodle and then I would like the grilled chicken, please. That's what I want. Okay. What California cuisine's emphasis on fresh local ingredients has influenced how Americans eat. Vern and Charlene Rollins carry that emphasis even further. The whole point of our restaurant is that things are fresh right out of the garden. We, we raise everything. So a carrot really tastes like a carrot, and a pea tastes like a pea, and a bean tastes like a bean. And people come here and they eat things fresh for the first time in their life. It's, it's a new experience to them, and it gives, it gives our restaurant a little bit something that sets us apart from everybody else, too. This is one of the little boys. In a month he'll be, he will be on the dinner table. Letting what's ripe in the garden determine the menu each day can be a nerve-wracking business. But the results are seen in each flawlessly prepared dish that leaves the kitchen here at the new Boonville Hotel. Say you did get your birthday party after all. You really thought we did? made it oh, after oh, all. Oh, yeah. But I need another glass of wine. Well, we have to order another bottle. <laughs> yeah. That's what that amounts to. You did hear we wanted another bottle of wine. 
there is no more pepperwood. Can I bring you another Chardonnay? Oh, all right. The whole reason of the restaurant has to do with growing our own food. So we looked all over the world for a place where we could do it, and we found this place in Boonville with this um, empty field back here. And six years later, this is the realization of what we've started. And we pick things almost to order. They're picked within hours before people eat them, sometimes within minutes before people eat them. People often ask us for recipes, and, you know, if I have carrots, I'll just take them in and cook them. You know, basically, it's take X or Y or Z and cook it until it's done. And the trick is to know when it's done and, you know, what when to pick it and when it's going to be the best when you pick it and having it fresh there in the first place to pick instead of thinking up a recipe and then thinking, well, where am I going to find these ingredients? Where am I ever going to find red okra? Or how would you ever think of a recipe for red okra unless you had it out there? And then what am I going to do with it? You cook it. Oh, it's fine. Thank you. Wait, let me, let me finish. Finish up. Mm -hmm. You always wonder if they're part of the family when they're there for a length of time. Yeah, do that. Very happy, happy 39. Thank you. <laughs> and now where are we going to go? I don't know. To dinner. <laughs> go ahead. Shall share with you. Shall <laughs> Well, we make raspberry sherbet, and we make raspberry preserves, and we make raspberry tarts, and we make raspberry layer cakes, and we make raspberries and cream, and we eat a lot of raspberries. We thought from the very beginning that we had to carry the development of California food one step farther, and both of us had a dream. And we had it separately. In fact, that was how we met each other. We were, well, we met each other, and we spent the whole first day talking about this exact sort of thing, and um, that sealed our fate, I guess. We just went on from there and got married six months later. <laughs> I was a lawyer, and I stopped being a lawyer and started being a, a, a restaurant owner and a cook. Um, I know other examples, people people being an accountant, and then all of a sudden they open juice stands. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> California is a, is a strange place because people seem to be free to do whatever they want to do. Perhaps that's good. I'm not advocating it for everybody in the world to keep changing what they do, but um, it's worked for us. Sacramento may be the state capital, but when Northern Californians talk about the city, they mean one place, San Francisco. A city remarkable for its tolerance and diversity. Let me give you an example. In the 1880s, Joshua Norton lost his fortune and then his mind. He declared himself to be the emperor of North America. Emperor Norton rode around San Francisco on his bicycle followed by Lazarus and Bummer, his two dogs. He was welcomed into the finest salons and restaurants where he charged his meals to accounts that nobody ever paid. He was penniless. He was cherished. When he died, the whole city turned out for his funeral. It was an international city forged by the gold rush. People came from every corner of the world, Europe, South America, Australia, the Eastern United States, and Asia. Lured by tales of the Golden Mountain, thousands of Chinese men arrived in the mid-1800s. They worked on the transcontinental railroad and agricultural projects throughout the state. When times were good, they were accepted. But when jobs were scarce, they became scapegoats for angry, unemployed men. For safety, they crowded into a few narrow streets of San Francisco, which became known as Chinatown. It was a society of bachelors. Anti-Asian laws restricted entry of Chinese women until World War II, when the Chinese community began to grow and family life blossomed. I was born in China, mainland China. My parents, both of them are doctors. 
uh, also we have four sisters most of us are all either doctors or nurse because my mother want us to be that kind of job Dr. Amy Chan, an acupuncturist, found eager Chinese patients in San Francisco, but was also sought out by the non-Chinese community. When we um, moved to this country, I tried to find everywhere to see which state they would uh, accept acupuncturists. I tried to go to Los Angeles, I tried to go to uh, Chicago, because I, my, my husband was there, and then uh, I found this area is good. People uh, in this state, they realize acupuncture more and more. It's more popular. More and more, they like uh, the natural way to health. Dr. Chan has found acceptance in Northern California, where willingness to try new ideas sometimes means trying very old ones. I enjoy my job very much, but I miss China so much. When I go to the Chinatown to buy uh, the grocery or to have uh, dinner or have a meal there, a restaurant, then I will enjoy all the Chinese food. It seems I go back to my home. <laughs> it's a small town. You get everything from Chinatown, especially the food, my motherland food. Food is one way many immigrants hold on to their traditions. The variety of cultures here enriches everyone's lives. Chinese and Latino, Japanese, Filipino, Italian. This mixture of cultures and traditions has created a city that has always attracted artists and writers. Perhaps none have described it as consistently and affectionately as Armistead Maupin. This is McCondry Lane on Russian Hill, which is the model for Barbary Lane in my four books. I lived on Russian Hill for five years, I guess, when I first moved here and had the most incredible variety of jobs. And the one thing I found was no matter how awful the little job was I had, I could come home to this neighborhood right here in the heart of the city uh, and feel a real special kind of peace. And there are places like this all over San Francisco that uh, restore the soul, really. The spell that San Francisco weaves affects visitors and residents alike. The city seems to be built to a human scale. Eccentricities are cherished and contradictions abound. Preservation has become a religion but the city that loves to restore Victorian buildings and cable cars doesn't hesitate to discard rigid social traditions and taboos. Perhaps the bracing ocean wind clears away cobwebs. Or perhaps it's because it could all disappear in an instant. For smug, tolerant, and beautiful San Francisco is perched precariously on the wrong side of an earthquake fault. There is a theory which I've mentioned in one of my books that San Franciscans are actually reincarnated citizens of the lost continent of Atlantis, the undersea kingdom, and that instinctively we've returned to this particular spot of the world because we know that it's going to crack off and fall into the sea and this is the quickest way to get back to our origins. And uh, the people who have mentioned this uh, think that it's supported by the fact that Atlantis itself had a large pyramid which dominated the skyline and there was a beacon burning at the top just like we have here in San Francisco. Most of California's 15,000 yearly earthquakes are so minor that people don't notice them but one morning in San Francisco in 1906 there was an earthquake people did notice. They rushed out of their homes in disbelief and then the fires started. In three days three-fourths of the city was destroyed the disaster that tore it apart brought its people together and they began to rebuild amid smoldering piles of rubble. It's very hard not to fall in love with the, the physical beauty of San Francisco. I saw it on my way to and from Vietnam and thought it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. On my first night back, my friend introduced me to a man there and said, uh, this is Armistead Maupin and he's just back from Vietnam. And the man came up and put his arms around me and gave me this big hug just on 
the basis of my being back from Vietnam. And the man was not gay. He was there with his wife. It was just his way of, you know, showing his concern for me. And I was amazed that there was a place where people behave that way. Nice hair. <laughs> this is Eureka Valley. I like that name because, of course, it means I have found it. And uh, when I moved here, uh, that's exactly the way I felt about it. Uh, the Castro District is what it's generally called. There's uh, four or five, uh, or more than that, I guess, a number of gay bars along the street that are kind of noisy but have very little to do with those of us who live here in the valley. Contrary to uh, popular belief, homosexuality is really no big deal here. People are actually beginning to get rather blasé about it here, and that's, that's what really freed me to be a complete human being. Well, it allowed me to sort of uh, become a writer, really. I was able to open up my heart when I stopped worrying about my sexuality. I could see the larger, the larger human issues in my work. People would say, oh, you write about heterosexuals so well, or you write about women so well. I write about people. The human heart is pretty much the, the same organ in, in, in every individual. And uh, I think that's the lesson that San Francisco teaches us, that we, when you have a mix as we have here, it comes down to the fact that we're simply all people and we have to learn to get along with each other. And we do that, I think, better than any other city on the face of the earth. The many neighborhoods and worlds of San Francisco nestle against each other. They usually just coexist. But sometimes the rumblings of great events transcend neighborhood boundaries, sending reverberations throughout the city. And San Franciscans all come together as one. My mother died of cancer in 1979, and she and my father came out to San Francisco the year before. I, I know because we had a sense that she didn't have much time left and they wanted to meet my friends. And uh, by the strangest irony, on their very last night in town, um, it was the day that Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk, our gay supervisor, were shot and killed at City Hall. And there was a candlelight march, uh, a, a silent vigil, as it were, um, to honor these men. And I wanted very much to participate in it. And at the same time, I wanted to spend time with my parents. I was afraid I might never see my mother again. So we said goodbye rather reluctantly, and I hugged them both and marched off down Market Street. And uh, it was about 15 minutes later when one of my friends tugged on my arm and said, look over there. And I did, and there were my mother and father, who were a little bit conservative and, well, very conservative and embarrassed about participating in any kind of uh, uh, what appeared to be a, a protest. And uh, I went over and took their arms and we walked up to City Hall together. And it was, a, it was a beautiful moment for me. It was as if my life had come together, finally, that the, my friends and family were one. And uh, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Northern California's fascination with alternatives takes many forms. Solitary dances pirouette above Altamont Pass, where the cool ocean air from the San Francisco Bay meets the heat of the Central Valley and is transformed into electricity. Whether it's alternative energy or alternative ways of living, people here are willing to try new and different paths. You're centered, but you also have awareness of behind as well as in front, of beneath you. Calm yourself totally, just a total sense of calmness. If you feel some kind of shakiness, just go with it for a while and use that 
give you a dish. I had thing. finally made it to New York City. I was a southern boy. And, you know, back in uh, the early 50s, to finally make it to New York City, that, what else could you ask, especially if you want to be a writer? And I got a job as a senior editor on Look Magazine, and I was living in New Canaan, Connecticut, which was really the place to live in the 1950s. And uh, one day my boss, the editor of Look, called me in and said, George, we want you to go out and set up an office in San Francisco. And my heart sank to go out where those uh, kind of crummy people with their strange cults and uh, those crazy kooks out there in California. I finally made it to New York, but I realized if I didn't do it, he'd give it to somebody else. And my editor said, well, you can come back in two or three years. So what happened? I came out here and became a kook. In Mill Valley, just yeah, north of San Francisco, like four, author and Aikido instructor George Leonard has been thinking and writing about California for over 20 years. Back east, you have the establishment is so much more powerful. Your family's been living there for years, perhaps. All of your neighbors, the ministers right down the street. Uh, the, the conventional forces that hold back change were at their weakest in California. And I think it really is because we had the frontier. Even those who didn't go shared in that experience, that frontier spirit. It shows in our movies, in our legends, in our myths. It's the idea of getting up and leaving what's established behind. It's taking off without having all the answers. Um, it's being willing to create new social forms. This angle is not holding. This angle is holding. So that idea, hey, if it hasn't been tried yet, let's try it. Okay. Giving back pressure here, controlling it with the thumb. So finally, we got to the end of the frontier, the last stop on the frontier trail, and here we have it, California. So I think what's going on here is perhaps the most powerful human laboratory in the creation of new personal and social forms that the world's ever known. It's terribly exciting out here. We have lost that old, secure faith in the impossible. As long as we can say, well, that's not possible, then, you see, I don't have to do anything about it. Well, then I can just go ahead. This can't be fixed. This can't be changed. So I'm not responsible. I can just go ahead being a slob if I want to. But we lost that faith. Maybe more things are possible than we dreamed possible. Once I discovered that, then when the opportunity to go back to New York in a managerial position on the magazine uh, came to me, I mean, I just kind of laughed. I said, come on, <laughs> forget it. This is a place where people not only have dreams, but try to make them true. The Point Reyes Lighthouse glances out across the Pacific, a beacon on the edge of the continent. You can still be alone with nature here, an experience some Northern Californians have been fighting to preserve for over a hundred years. The foggy peninsula of Point Reyes has its own grave beauty. But breathtakingly beautiful places are found throughout Northern California. The most splendid and the most famous is Yosemite Valley. In 1864, President Lincoln laid the foundation for the national park system when he signed a bill to hold Yosemite for public use for all time. The spirit of Yosemite descends from naturalist and conservationist John Muir, who roamed alone through the Sierra Nevadas in the late 1800s, scaling peaks, traveling light, accepting nature on its own terms. Some like to take nature sitting down, 
Others, like Ron Kauk and Ed Berry, take a more energetic approach. depends on your own skill and the rope that connects you to your partner, where moving a few feet may take several hours. You're testing yourself to the extreme limits of your abilities and resources. At the same time, you feel connected to everything around you. From the tiny sparkling granules of rock next to your face, to the huge expanse of sky at your back, and the river rushing by thousands of feet below. When you reach the summit, you've reached out to the surrounding world and deep inside yourself. The rock you climbed is unchanged, but you have tested yourself against it and gained some of its strength. That sense of unity, of peace, of freedom that only nature can provide. You don't have to scale the highest mountains to enjoy the extravagance of nature in Northern California. The coast from Big Sur to Southern Oregon is stalked by ancient giants who live for a millennium. Some people think if you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. But another attitude grew up here in Northern California, first expressed by John Muir, and now carried on by people like Elizabeth Terwilliger. They say, hi, blue sky. Hi, Thank you, Mr. Sun. Thank you, Mr. Sun. We need a little more of you. We need a little more of you. Hi, Coast Redwood Tree. Hi, Coast Redwood Tree. Redwood tree. You, have you have straight lines. You have straight lines. Now, you say hi, Thimbleberry. Hi, Thimbleberry. Now, everybody put some big antlers on your head. Working with children is just joy. Look what's over here, something special. Children are tuned in to the out of doors. So many people just sit around and smoke and yak and yak and yak. So many adults, when they talk, they tell about all their aches and their complaints. If you've got aches and complaints, tell them to your doctor when you're in out of the, in the out of doors. What flowers did you see? Did you see Mr. Snake? Did you see Mr. Earthworm? What footprints did you see? It's just the joy of discovery, using all your senses. Don't be shut in in a tight little box. One, two, three, go! Now watch your stick. Which way is it going? That way. Say hi, sticks. Hi, sticks. Have a nice trip. Have a nice trip. Now let's see what else we can find over here. Oh, look over here. Oh, something to eat. Nom, 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 nom. Thank you for your leaves, Mrs. Fennel. Thank you for your leaves, Mrs. Fennel. They're tasty, too. They're tasty, too. Now we'd like to find your brown seeds. Let's see if we can find her brown seeds. I am 76 years old, and I have been working with little children for many years. When you see a need, you get in and do something about it. 
As a child in Sunday school, we had a wonderful song about help somebody today, today, somebody along life's way. Let sorrow be ended, the friendless be friend. Oh, help somebody today. <laughs> I can't sing very well anymore. Um, and it's just the joy of helping somebody because it's your problems that get you down. <laughs> but going in the out of doors, your problems fall off. Everybody look around and say, hi, Hills. Hi, Hills. Hi, Trees. Hi, Trees. Hi, Mount Tamil Pius. Hi, Let's say hi, Lagoon. Hi, Lagoon. Hi, Bay. Hi, Bay. Thank you, Mr. Sun, for coming out. Thank you, Mr. Sun, for coming out. We're getting warm now. We're getting warm now. Now, close your eyes and answer me. Work, work. Let's say hi, Mr. Raven. Hi, Mr. Raven. All right, open your eyes. so much. We have the ocean. We have the grassy hills. We have the saltwater marshes. We have the woods. You have islands. You have peninsulas. You have streams. You have rivers. You have mountains. You have lakes. You don't want to miss anything. You're only on earth for a short time. And so what you look for is the beauty of the out of doors, the sounds, the sights, the colors, the silences. They came here seeking gold, but found something infinitely more valuable. The wild and beautiful land with its amazingly abundant resources was not an invitation to idleness. It was a mirror for Northern Californians to look inside themselves to discover the richness and variety within. If nature around us is capable of so much, then we must be also. I'm Hal Holbrook. Join us again. of America. A comprehensive learning system is available for classroom use from Rain Tree Publishers. For information about this video encyclopedia, call Rain Tree toll free 1-800-558-1580. That's 1-800-558-1580.